Thanks for that great lead in. My name is Teresa Goddard. I'm here with my colleague Bill McCollum. Bill and I are with the Job Accommodation Network. I'm a point person for the sensory team at the Job Accommodation Network and I've been here since 2008. And Bill, would you like to tell us about yourself? Yes. Um, my name is Bill McCollum. I'm a consultant on the motor team here at JAN. This is actually my second uh, tenure here at JAN. I was here for a couple years before and just came back recently. Um, so I, and I apologize if you guys hear noise in the background. We've got a power washer right outside our window. So, so hopefully that noise isn't bothersome throughout this presentation. <laughs> So uh, today Bill and I are going to talk with you a little bit about the Job Accommodation Network, also known as JAN, and what we do here. And then we're going to go into some detail on the interactive process, which is a process by which employers and employees or applicants work together to come up with an accommodation that's going to be effective in uh, meeting the needs of the employee or the applicant. And we're also going to show you some real life accommodation examples, including a number of situations and solutions that are drawn from real JAN calls, people that have actually called in here and gotten technical assistance and information. We're also going to show you some resources from our website, including JAN's searchable online accommodation resource, which is also known as SOAR. And we'll show you how you can use that to explore accommodation ideas on your own if you feel like you uh, want to explore on your own and don't feel like calling in. Finally, we're going to try to save a little time at the end for questions. If you have questions after the webinar, you can also send them to Jan at the address jan at askjan.org. Jan specializes in providing information about job accommodations for all industries, job categories, and impairments. And we also provide technical assistance on employment legislation, including the Americans with Disabilities Act. We specialize in Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And uh, we also provide technical assistance on the Rehabilitation Act, specializing in 501. We are a free and confidential service, and again, we do provide technical assistance on job accommodations and employment legislation. We're able to offer this service free of charge thanks to our funding, which comes from the Office of Disability Employment Policy at the Department of Labor. We do strive to be user friendly and easy to use, and while we're happy to talk to anybody who would like to give us a call or contact us online, we are primarily focused on providing technical assistance to employers individuals with disabilities, whether they are job seeking or already on the job, service providers such as rehabilitation professionals, and uh, of course anyone else can contact us as well. We do get a lot of calls from legal professionals and even from medical providers. So next my colleague Bill is going to tell you a little bit about the resources that are available on our website. Uh, go ahead, Bill. So like Teresa mentioned, we you know, pride ourselves on being user friendly, so we like to think of our technical assistance being very practical, both on the level of accommodation ideas in the workplace, but also on the um, guidance around some of the legislation. So there are some resources on our website um, that are you know, very user friendly, practical guidance. Um, such as our A to Z with disabilities and accommodation, our uh, searchable online accommodation resource, which Teresa mentioned. Two things that I really want to highlight that are on this slide are our employers and employees' practical guides. Uh, you know, there's that word again, practical. I tell a lot of our callers that they uh, they can become some of the nation's leading experts on Title I of the ADA by simply reading our guides which are set up in a very simple, easy to read question and answer format that are not too long, that are not in, written in legalese, that give uh, hyperlinks and, and, and references to other documentation if somebody wants some more detailed, more legal understanding. Um, you know, and then you know, there's also our ADA and Re Rehabilitation Act library and uh, information about the interactive process. And we're going to touch upon these resources a little more later. You know, our, our website is loaded with information, uh, but it is practical and easy to read and easy to use when you know what you're looking for. So, 
we're also, besides the practical uh, guidance that you can find on our website through some of those resources, uh, we're used by people as a referral source. Um, you know, we refer people obviously in accommodation situations to different vendors, products, and services, um, to different enforcement agencies when people want to make a complaint. You know, we we are not a uh, a legal authority or any type of enforcement authority. So when when there is a is possible issue of discrimination or, or such, we uh, we refer people to the appropriate agency. Um, you know, whether it's an ADA issue, Rehab Act issue, or you know, even some other laws such as wage and hour issues, you know, we'll refer them to Department of Labor's wage and hour division or, or other appropriate agencies. You know, we refer you know people to to appropriate organizations depending on maybe their the health impairment they're de they're dealing with, or the or whatever issue they may be having in term having in terms of a legal issue or whatever. Federal programs, accommodation programs. And uh, you know, one of my favorite referrals is the assistive technology projects, like yourself. So they're the California Ability Tools, um, and and, uh, and the voc rehab agencies that are state by state. And a lot of uh, businesses or organizations will sometimes have as part of their reasonable accommodation or active process, where outside re uh, resources have to be contacted at experts or technical assistance needs to be obtained and and we can serve as that procedural contact for a lot of employers in that type of situation where they need they need to make contact with some type of referral source or technical assistance source um, we can serve as that point of contact we uh, here at Jan we you can see some of the Contact information we get: 40,000 contacts a year via telephone, email, Jan on Demands, which um, is just our electronic form online. We do live chats. Our consultants are are always online chatting with folks. We're able to contact through various social networks. I think we're even set up now to 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 contact people back and forth via uh, text messaging. Um, <clears throat> Over 3.5 million web page requests each year uh, through our newsletter, publications, and resources. Um, and we do have uh, Spanish translation for a lot of our publications and resources that are on our website. And uh, and a Spanish speaking person here that can who can speak to people by phone at certain times as well. We're organized in such a way here that. We have, um, you know, you'll see the you see the teams there: sensory team, a motor team, cognitive neurological team, entrepreneurship team. So our consultants are divided up amongst those areas of expertise. Although we, you know, we all serve amongst across lines at various times as needed. But um, our consultants are are pretty wide ranging in their backgrounds and their expertise. Um, but if an individual or a, an, an, an employer calls, you know, if, typically if it's a, you know, let's say a vision issue, they'll they'll try to be placed with one of our sensory team members as an example. Or um, if it's you know, say a back impairment and an issue around lifting, uh, they would be placed with a member of the motor team. Uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, and as appropriate with the rest of the teams. Our entrepreneurship team is about helping individuals with disabilities as far as self-employment options and, and resources. You know, that's that's kind of another service that we offer beyond just practical guidance around accommodations in the workplace. So the interactive process, you know, that's kind of the term that's that's uh, bandied about regarding the the readable common accommodation negotiation in the workplace. Um, you know, the the ADA doesn't really set forth a, a specific process that employers must use in terms of accommodating an employee. It just sets forth the obligation and the, you know, and, and various types of things that are considered reasonable accommodations. Um, 
So here at Jan, we've sort of set up this six-step uh, interactive process, you know, as sort of a guide for for employers to use. Um, but again, the, you know, this isn't necessarily set forth in the law. This is just our, you know, our technical assistance, you know. And you can see the six steps here of making an accommodation request. Um, the law does not require individuals to put it, you know, use any specific type of form or or put the request in writing. Anytime an individual is facing a barrier in the workplace or some sort of, um, you know, work work related problem, you know, in performing their job or or being on the job because of a health impairment. And they rate, disclose that issue to the employer. That basically initiates the process under the law and initiates the employer's obligation. Um, you know, then there's an exchange of information, exploring accommodation options, choosing accommodation, implementing the accommodation, and monitoring it for its effectiveness. You know, not every accommodation is you know effective from the outset. Effective meaning it allows the employee to work and perform their essential job tasks effectively. So it's important to you know always monitor accommodations, and plus, as you as you folks probably know, with various health issues and, and disability related issues, the conditions uh, can often change and come and go, and so there may be need changes to the accommodation. You can find a, a, a publication that details this process on our website under the A to Z of disabilities and accommodations. If you go in by topic. There's an alphabetical list, and the interactive process is listed there, and you can you can get a publication on this process. So people often wonder about the definition of a reasonable accommodation and what exactly those words mean. Uh, we have here on this slide a definition from the Title I Technical Assistance Manual, which you can find linked on the JAN website. And here's what the EEOC has to say about the definition of a reasonable accommodation. A reasonable accommodation is any change in the work environment or in the way things are usually done that results in an equal employment opportunity for an individual with a disability. Examples of reasonable accommodation include making existing facilities accessible, job restructuring, modifying work schedules, reassignment, Acquiring or modifying equipment or devices, adjusting or modifying policies, and providing qualified readers or interpreters. And uh, people often wonder about the word reasonable in another guidance document called Reasonable Accommodation and Undue Hardship under the ADA. The EEOC clarifies that reasonable really just means reasonable on its face or ordinarily in the run of cases. Uh, another way to say reasonable might be feasible. Um, and in order to meet the definition of a reasonable accommodation, an accommodation needs to be effective, as Bill mentioned. And that means effective in meeting the needs of the individual and allowing them to perform the essential functions of a position and have equal access to the benefits and privileges of employment, like training. Um, there may also be a need for reasonable accommodation in order for someone to have equal access to an application process. And all this technical language, I know it can get confusing. That's why Jan provides a number of resources on our website um, so that the information you may need to know is available to you in what we call plain English. And here's one example. Oh. I just I wanted to point out too, because this comes up a lot in a lot of the calls that we get. You know, a person will call and say, Well, is, is that a reasonable accommodation? And if you take an example from the previous slide there, like modifying someone's schedule, modifying a schedule in general terms under the ADA is a reasonable accommodation. Now that does not mean in every situation, every circumstance that that, that accommodation, it may or may not be an undue hardship to the employer depending on the circumstance. You know, for example, maybe a receptionist who needs to be on duty at certain hours, they might not be able to modify that person's schedule. So although under the law that, that is in the class of reasonable accommodations, it still may be an undue hardship for that specific employer. So you know, so what you know what may be in the class of reasonable accommodations does not necessarily mean 
that an employer is obligated to allow it under every circumstance. Absolutely. That's that's a great way of putting it, Bill. What I'll often say is, uh, yes, that's an example of a type of reasonable accommodation, but we can't say for sure if it's going to be reasonable at your job. And we can't say for sure if your employer has to do it or not, because that's something that's case by case. So uh, that list that we just gave you, and some more things we're going to talk about in a minute, are examples of types of accommodations that may be reasonable or may uh, be an undue hardship in some settings. It just depends. So to help you sort all this out, uh, we have a screenshot here of a publication from the JAN website called uh, The Employer's Practical Guide uh, to Reasonable Accommodation Under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And what it has is a number of topics addressed in a user-friendly question and answer style. And of course, if you do have more questions, even after reviewing this information, you can always call in or contact us by internet for individualized consultation and technical assistance. So next we're going to uh, talk about uh, some typical types of workplace accommodation. And these are types of accommodations that we may think of as typical because they come up a lot. But that doesn't mean that uh, they're going to be expressed the same way in every reasonable accommodation scenario. And it doesn't mean that every single one would be reasonable in every single setting. But here are some examples. Uh, leave and modified schedules are something that really come up a lot in the workplace. A person might need leave for treatment or to recover um, or to get a condition under control. And a modified schedule could also be an important part of a treatment plan for a condition. For example, somebody with diabetes may need a modified break schedule in order to uh, test their sugar, take medication and they eat as often as their doctor wants them to do in order to manage their condition. Modified policies and procedures are also a very common form of accommodation. And usually employers don't mind these too much because they normally don't cost a lot of money to provide. Usually they are free. And a typical accommodation, for instance, for someone with diabetes might be a permission to store food appropriate, appropriate food for their condition, maybe beverages in their immediate work area. Uh, or maybe modifying a policy so that they can eat in their work area right at their desk. Uh, sometimes uh, there might be a cost involved if an employer decides to purchase, say, a miniature fridge to keep in the workstation. But oftentimes modifying a policy is something that really doesn't cost anything. Uh, attendance policies, that's another area where a policy might need to be modified as part of an accommodation. Uh, bring your device to work programs are another area where you might need to make an exception to allow something that uh, might not ordinarily be allowed. Uh, and that's something we could talk with you in detail about if it comes up and you'd like to call us. Uh, parking is another big area where we get a lot of questions, especially this time of year when the weather changes. Uh, on our website, we do have a link to general information on parking and accommodation. And a typical way to accommodate is to uh, offer to designate the closest available employee space uh, to the entrance that the employee needs to use. Of course, it can get tricky when you have more than one employee with parking need. Telework is another common form of accommodation. Uh, that comes up a lot when there's a commuting issue or when it's difficult to make the workplace usable and accessible for some other reason. Modifying the workspace could include anything from replacing a desk to changing the floor plan to moving an employee's workstation to a completely different area. Uh, it could include the installation of uh, materials like noise abatement materials for someone who is a very noise sensitive. Uh, and those could be you know, really fancy things like noise absorption foam that are really designed to take noise away and, and uh, dampen it. But it could be simple things like adding carpeting to an area or adding some wall hangings. Modifying communication methods, that's useful for someone who is deaf or hard of hearing. You can use email or instant messaging that might be easier for them to use. Uh, providing ergonomic equipment, that's very typical. It's especially helpful for those with cumulative trauma disorders and other upper extremity impairments. And I myself use an alternative mouse and ergonomic keyboard. Now, if you do call in about ergonomic equipment, you might get to talk to Bill because that's one of his specialty areas. Bill, did you have anything you wanted to say on ergonomics? Uh, not specifically right now, except I maybe would we'll point out that we do have a, a short publication that's a good starting point for a lot of folks uh, regarding ergonomic resources and, and equipment. 
And there's also in our training library on our website, there's a good uh, webcast training specifically on ergonomics that a couple of our motor team members did not too long ago. So those are a couple of re resources that, that get into ergonomics um, that are on our website currently. Yeah, and of course, um, assistive technology might be needed for something like computer access or in order to access the telephone and use that effectively. And again, these are just a list of typical types of accommodations that we hear about a lot, but no two accommodations are the same. I know, Bill, you like to say that there really is no such thing as a typical accommodation. Right. Yeah. No, no cookie cutter approach, really. There's, there's some common tools and common equipment and common solutions, but uh, people with the same health impairments or, you know, or completely different health impairments, you know, that, you, you know, the two people with different ones might require the same solution, whereas the the person with the same health impairment might require two different solutions entirely. And you and you folks that work with ability tools and AT AT stuff, you know, in your work, you probably know that that there's varying levels of comfort that people have with different technologies. You know, and some folks like a very low tech simple approach. Some like, you know, some are comfortable with all the bells and whistles and, 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 and it may be more effective for them. So it really depends on a case by case scenario. Absolutely. It pays to listen to the individual when they're telling you what works for them and what doesn't work. And next I just want to give you a quick overview of typical accommodation challenges. And of course, what we mean is these are things that come up a lot in the jam calls. Uh, sometimes there might be a problem with an accommodation when a new supervisor comes on board. For instance, every supervisor has their own way of doing things. Everybody wants to make their mark when they're starting out. And a new supervisor, one, might not understand um, all of the accommodations that are in place or why they are in place. And uh, they also might just have a different view for how things are going to run under their leadership, and certain parts of the accommodation might not fit well with their view. An accommodation might also need uh, adjusting uh, when there's a new task added. So when you go to add a new task to someone's job description, or maybe when uh, one person leaves the workplace and their job gets absorbed by some of the other folks. Anytime you're taking on a new task, there's a chance that there might be a new accommodation needed. But sometimes there might be a safety issue or a qualification issue. Uh, that could be uh, because workplace conditions change, or it could come up because of a progressive condition, like a progressive eye disease, where you know maybe at first a person is getting by with little accommodation, maybe even no particular accommodation. But as their condition changes and progresses, uh, they might need to move on to using, say, screen magnification software. And then maybe later on they move on to using screen reading software. So the accommodation changes as the person changes. Um, and sometimes an older accommodation strategy might not work when there is an update to software or to equipment. So in other words, the way you used to access a system might change if the system changes or if the system is updated. And uh, I didn't put this on the previous slide, but uh, another typical issue that comes up is funding. People always wonder, well, how are we going to afford this accommodation? And of course, Jan's research shows that uh, uh, a good half of accommodations don't cost a thing. When there is a cost, a typical cost is $500, but sometimes things cost more, and sometimes $500 can be a lot of money. So actually, it's gone back and forth over the years between five and six hundred, but. That's a typical range. And Bill, I think you were going to tell us a little bit about the uh, funding information on the JAN website. Yeah, again, if you, uh, uh, well, I guess I should point out too first that, um, you know, under the law, under the ADA Title I, the cost of accommodation is the responsibility of, of the employer. You know, so, you know, just because there may not be funding available or which often there is not specific funding available. You know, the employer is still still responsible for for the cost of an accommodation, and just because it co may cost some money, that in and of itself is not always caused to say, well, that's an, an undue hardship providing this accommodation. 
you know, that the the money can't come into the to that equation, but but employers can't just lean on the cost and that well we'd have no specific you know, we don't have any specific budget line item for this, so uh we can't we can't do it. You know. That's my employer voice. But uh, the so you know, so again the law requires the employer bear the brunt of a of an accommodation unless it's a personal use item meaning something that the employee would use in their everyday life and use at home. Um, but if you know, on our website, if you go to the A to Z of disabilities again and go in by topic, you know, again in that alphabetical list by topic, there's a link to this page that you see on this slide for funding links. You know, there are a couple of tax credit programs that have that kind of, to be honest, that have come and gone. Uh, you know, disability access credit, which really has more to do with with physical accessibility issues um, and architectural barriers. There's the Work Opportunity Tax Credit Program, which is a program that tries to provide you know this tax incentive for employers to hire uh, populations with different different barriers to employment, such as ex felons, uh, the elderly youth, uh, and, and people with disabilities, among others. Unfortunately, right now that I think expired as of, as of the end of 2013. It's kind of still there on the table. My best guess is it'll come back at some point. Um, so it's something to be aware of that is out there for employers, especially small businesses. You know, if hiring an individual with a disability, they can get a, you know a fairly significant tax credit. Uh, you know, with, through those employees. You can get information about more detail about that program on uh, the Department of Labor's website, the OL.gov, um, and just do a search for work opportunity tax credit. Um, you know, there are, there are sometimes specific grant programs and such for individuals, um, and, and other funding. You know, sometimes you'll find those with local uh, charities or other community service organizations. A good place. The look is often through Centers for Independent Living, which I know Ability Pools, you know, is closely tied with, with you know some of that in California. You know, we often, you know, at least I do often refer people to uh, state assisted technology programs, not necessarily as a source of funding, but as a resource that might help curb cost and expense, you know, because a lot of programs like your like yours have lending libraries and things where people can try equipment before they purchase equipment to see if it is effective or not in an accommodation scenario. And then finally, uh, you know, state vocational rehabilitation programs are always a good place to start as well for individuals that are in jobs or are looking to work. Um, you know, they, you know, they they work a little bit different in every state, but um, but state VR programs will often have funding available. To help individuals with with things that they may need for work, individuals with disabilities. Um, so you know, so they're often a good resource and and can provide the individual with with financial support, you know, for for things for for training or other things that might help them as far as employment. Um, you know, and then also, I guess the other thing I wanted to mention was. With regards to specific, you know, disabilities, specific health impairments, sometimes organizations, which you can find on our website, um, like one example I noted was like the uh, Cancer Fund of America, you know, that because obviously cancer being such a pervasive, uh, you know, disease, you know, that's one where you know there's there's sometimes some funding available for individuals, but. If you, again, if you go to that A to Z of disabilities link on our website, if you go in by disability, there's a whole list of different health impairments, and, and, and under most of those, there'll be publications that'll list organizations, what, some national, some local, some regional, that individuals that might might suffer from that impairment might might want to contact and reach out to, as, you know, if they're looking for, you know, funding or financial assistance or anything related to. Whether it's accommodation or other issues, so okay. Thanks for that great overview on funding, Bill. 
Um, another thing that we always like to suggest is to see if there's an AT reuse program in your area. And uh, we all often refer to the state AT project to find out if something like that exists in your area. The next thing we want to talk about is as you're implementing the accommodation and also moving on to the monitoring stage, uh, what are some things that might need to be done? Well, a device might need to be customized in order to meet an individual's preferences. So just because you buy the device doesn't mean you're done. Somebody may need to help with setting that up. Um, an employee might need some instruction in the use of assistive technology, especially if they're using something that's new to them or a new version. And we've recently gotten informal guidance from the EEOC indicating that employers uh, may need to be more involved in providing training on how to use an accommodation effectively. Uh, and also, there may be some need for assistance, say, from an IT team to integrate a device with a computer system or with a telephone system. Next, we're going to get to my very favorite part of the presentation, situations and solutions. And all of the examples that you're going to see are drawn from real GAN calls. Uh, this is a case that I handled. A student employee had autism spectrum disorder and used hearing aids. She needed to discuss project details with her team, but face-to-face -face communication was difficult for her, and she also had difficulty on the telephone. So after a, a conversation in which uh, Jan and the employer and the employee all participated, the employer chose to set up a secure IM client, uh, so an instant messaging client so that all team members could discuss projects via chat. And the employer also worked with the employee to find appropriate telephone equipment. Now, they didn't report the cost of this accommodation, but one thing that the supervisor of this employee did tell me is that all members of the team found it helpful to communicate by chat and that he particularly liked it because he could go back into the chat logs and see um, how everyone was participating, what was said, and it was a good tool for him as a supervisor to stay on top of things. So next I want to tell you about a teacher at an elementary school. Uh, she had been diagnosed with both ADD and OCD, and she had great difficulty getting to work on time. She had asked for an accommodation of a flexible schedule. Um, on the days uh, when she couldn't get to the school by the time the children arrived to the classroom, she had asked that the principal come into her classroom and get her day started. And I'm sure you can guess how that went over. Just remember, just because something could be a potential accommodation doesn't mean it's the one you're going to get. So what happened? Uh, unsurprisingly, this accommodation request was denied. But eventually, as part of the interactive process, the teacher was convinced to make lists of what needed to be done at night, like getting her clothing and lunch and school items ready, and using a watch with multiple settings to help her better pace herself in the morning. She also devised a checklist system so that she did not do multiple checks of locked doors, the oven, the iron, and other things that concerned her and held her up in the morning. And I can really relate because my husband has to check the fridge and the stove before we leave every morning. Um, and if this accommodation were happening today, I might also suggest a number of apps that can be used as checklist tools. So that was an accommodation where the person did not actually get what they wanted, but something effective was put into place. And I believe Bill is going to tell us about a social worker. Yep. You know, this one's a, you know, I hate to say mundane, but you know it's pretty. It's a common, common one we get a call on carpal tunnel syndrome. You know, it's a case for a social worker. You know, having typed up a lot of case notes, so having difficulties because because of that uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. The employer purchased you know speech recognition software. You know, a pad for the person's chair and a new ergonomic mouse. Cost was three hundred thirty-six dollars. Uh, you know, re reduce the employee's pain, increase her productivity. You know, speech recognition software. You know, I'm sure, is something that most of you folks are familiar with. You know, the one that comes up a lot here. It's, it, you know, again, going back to that word practical. It's not always a practical solution in every situation where someone's task, you know, could really 
and it could really use speech recognition software because it depends on the work environment. So that's that's an example where a solution that may sometimes immediately come to mind in a scenario because of someone's limitation or the or the task that they're having trouble with, it may not be practical given the workplace environment or you know the specific job job uh, job environment. So so again back to that there you know idea that there's not always a cookie cutter approach even even in a typical scenario like carpal tunnel. Um, the next one you'll see uh, a plant supervisor with arthritis having trouble walking on concrete. Um, so he requested anti-fatigue matting throughout the plant. The employer was concerned that matting would create a trip hazard for others. You know, with the um, with the ADA reasonable accommodation obligation, you know, one of the things that an employer may claim would cause an undue hardship is when a, a, a possible accommodation might create a direct threat to health and safety of the individual or other employees. You know, and so that was the concern here with this employer that that, that, that matting would cause a trip hazard. Um, so the employer contacted us for options. Uh, you know, our, our consultants, you know, uh, talked about different anti-fatigue show covers that, that helped, uh, you know, alleviate any possible risk, met the employee's medical needs, allowed him to do his job, um, help alleviate some of that, you know, pain and issues he's had, he was having with arthritis, and um, and avoided any safety concerns that the employer had. So, and Teresa is next going to tell us about a customer service rep. So we got this call about a customer service representative who had a circulatory condition. Uh, so she needed to move her legs periodically, which most of us would probably do by walking. But uh, the job required that all employees stay at their desks unless they were on scheduled breaks. Uh, now, could they have modified the policy? Sure. But their productivity was measured by the number of calls completed, and we know that an employer does not have to uh, change a production standard or a productivity standard in order to accommodate someone. So this person really did need to move their legs, even when they were on a break, uh, but they needed to stay at the risk while doing it. So in this case, the employer purchased an under-the-desk exercise pedal device. Um, and they're often called a foot peddler if you go looking on Google for them. Um, and this enabled the employee to exercise her legs while on the phone. And this is a $40 accommodation that enabled the employee to meet production standards and take care of her health at the same time. Now, um, I actually have one of these in my office that I got just to kind of test it out. And I will say, uh, if you're looking at one, you want one with a nice sturdy base that's not going to move around a lot. And uh, you also have to be careful with the placement because if you have a slide out keyboard tray, your knees might be bumping on that thing. So uh, it's one of those things that can be frustrating if you don't have it set up just so, but it can be really, really handy if you have it set up right. Okay, and uh, next I want to tell you about a receptionist. Uh, this was a receptionist in training at an employment services provider. And uh, this uh, person in training was hard of hearing and also had a vision impairment and had a history of meningitis. And they were also thinking that they might have a diagnosis of dementia. At that time, a diagnosis of dementia was being explored for this particular person. And the reason all this came up is that after three weeks of training, he was still unable to answer the phone correctly. And the employer had talked with the trainee about getting some different phone equipment, maybe uh, modifying the training techniques. But this trainee was very, very insistent, stubborn you might say, about not needing help. So what is an employer to do? Well, this employer did a lot. I, I would say they really went above and beyond. But uh, they purchased a CCTV, a digital recorder, a phone with bump dots to kind of help find the numbers, uh, a headset, tablets for writing that had very large lines, an in-out board with pictorial representations, and they also purchased hearing aids, which uh, if you've ever called and talked to me about hearing aids, you will know that's something that employers are rarely required to do. It's something they could do if they wanted. Uh, but it's unusual for an employee to do it just because it's unusual for there to be an obligation to do so, and they are so expensive. 
In addition, the employer also helped with transportation. And we know that typically an employer does not have to provide transportation to and from work uh, unless there's some special situation, like they're doing so for other employees. So this employer really did a lot. And when we did a follow-up call with them, the employer was still in the midst of a trial to see how everything was working out, but they did report that the receptionist was able to come to work and both feel productive and, more importantly, be productive. Uh, and this was all at a cost of $9,780. A big chunk of that was probably the hearing aids. We always say uh, a lot of accommodations don't cost anything. Most of them don't cost a lot. This is one that costs a little bit more. But the employer was doing some things that they may not have been obligated to do as well, which was very, very nice of them, and we were happy to hear it. And Bill? So, yep. So here we have a, another scenario with a social uh, service worker traveling between different work sites. You know, I don't know, maybe a situation visiting clients at different locations. Um, the, the social workers typically travel with a laptop, but this particular employee had uh, a problem lifting and carrying around the laptop, way more than she was, uh, than her restrictions from her, her medical professional, her doctor. Uh, you know, the laptop exceeded those restrictions. Um, so one of our consultants suggested exploring, uh, you know, a lighter notebook or tablet PC, you know, could be used to complete the task that the employee needed to do while on the road. Um, you know, so, you know, that's an example, you know, again, of just a very practical solution, you know, Example that's a little bit older, you know, that that will come to more people's minds these days because tablets are becoming more and more common in the workplace, obviously. But um, we have a chart here that that shows different uh, size, you know, sizes and weights of uh, some typical tablets. Of course, it's probably out of date as soon as we make one, a new one up. But uh, especially just thinking that Apple just released a couple new uh, iPads just recently, but. Um, but that, you know that's just it's a good reference to give you some idea, which the kind of thing you, a lot of you folks are probably already aware of. But um, but it's you know it's it's also the kind of practical information that you need to think about in terms of workplace accommodations. You know the weight and size of things can really matter when you're talking about different motor limitations. Um, you know so oftentimes when when people think of technology solutions. You know, they don't always consider the physical side of the technology. You know, so that you know, that's why I kind of included this table just to, just to highlight that idea of, you know, because you know, you know, say for example, you're dealing with someone with uh, multiple sclerosis or, or cerebral palsy, which can have varying s symptoms. You know, some motor, some sensory, some what you know, different things. You got to take it all into account. So we're getting close on time here. So. Um, you know, just wanted to highlight, and I'll try to do this quickly, and so you, so we we'll have time for questions. You know, again, our website, our uh, our accommodation database. You can go into that. We call it SOAR. You can select by impairment, and I should say we we use the word impairment. Some people at times take issue with that word because it maybe has a negative connotation. We use that word because that's the language that's used in the law. So just so you're aware of that, the ADA uses the word impairment, so we use the word impairment. Um, you know, you can select by impairment, by limitation, and go through that database to find different accommodation ideas. And I would encourage you folks out there, if you know of products or vendors or things that might be useful that aren't in our, ad our database, if you're looking through it and you notice some holes or or some you, know, you have some suggestions, please let us know and we'll, you know, we'll add that information. Um, other resources, again, uh, our ADA library, you can find the ADA Title I Technical Assistance Manual. It's a, a little more technical than our employer employee practical guides. Um, you know, I pointed a couple times to the, to the link of A to Z of disabilities and accommodations where you can go in by topic or by disability, and there's alphabetical lists of different topics and different different health impairments that you can choose and get information on, um, different publications. Um, 
and you and you'll see the other, the other resources there that you can go through our website to get more detailed information or to speak directly with a consultant. So how do you how do you find out more about assistive technology and accommodations or or maybe just the ADA in general? You know, again, access us through our website or give us a call to talk with one of our consultants. Use the SOAR database. Um, of course, we're telling you to contact yourself here, <laughs> but yeah, but, but yeah, but you guys, we we often refer people to you uh, to Ability Tools, I should say. I don't know if everybody in the audience necessarily works for Ability Tools, but um, then there's also for federal agencies the Computer Electronics Accommodation Programs uh, CAP um, is a good resource for federal agencies and federal employees. And we just have a couple of uh, screenshots of the JAN website just to give you kind of a map for how to get around. This is our main site, askjan.org. And we were uh, talking about the, the uh, searchable online accommodations resource. To get to that, you click on search accommodations database at the top. Then you'll get this screen and you want to click on the uh, little image of a magnifying glass. You can select an impairment. We're just going to do a quick example. And on the next page, once you've selected an impairment, uh, in this case we pick multiple sclerosis, next you would pick the limitation. In this case we're going to pick speech impairment, communicating with others. And then we're going to look at accommodation options. And uh, let's assume this is a person with multiple sclerosis with a soft voice. They need some voice amplification. And if you click on that, you will be able to see a little explanation of what voice amplification is and a list of vendors that carry voice amplification devices. So that's just a quick little tour of SOAR on our website. A couple of resources that are also on our website. Uh, we do have a list of state AT projects. Of course, you know who you are, but if you want to find another one, we have a list. There's also a list of state vocational rehabilitation programs on, on there, too. Absolutely, we should have put a screenshot of that. But I didn't think of that. I just now thought of it. I mentioned them earlier. Yeah. And we've got the cap.tricare.mil if you have a federal employee that you're working with. And we have just a few more questions. Uh, time for questions. And um, of course, you can always visit askjan.org. So while we see what questions we may have, I want to tell you that the Jan phone number is 800-526-7234. Or uh, by TTY, you can reach us at 877-781-9403. And you can email us at jan at askjan.org. Do we have questions? While we're waiting any questions, you know, I would say in general, just thinking about you know, that, that interactive process and negotiating accommodations in the workplace. And the slide that Teresa went over regarding challenges to accommodation, you know, one of the biggest challenges is simply communication. There's employees and employers talking to each other about about what the issue is. You know, you know, I, I tell employees not to let necessarily their physician or whomever do the talking for them. It's important that they are active in the process as well in communicating what challenges they're having. I'm not just bringing in a medical slip that says, you know, can't lift 20 pounds or whatever. You know, be, you know, be specific, be practical. You know, and, and, and open communication is an important part of the process. Absolutely, it's so important to take ownership of the situation and advocate for yourself. Of course, you want to have uh, people there for support or being able to provide information to support your position. But I think it's so important for an employer and applicant to really take ownership and show that they know what they need and can advocate for themselves. We can point out too that, of course, employers. In this process, do have a right to, you know, to some medical documentation in an accommodation scenario. If if an employee is is stating that some health issue is is creating some sort of you know impediment or barrier for them with their job, the employer has a right to some medical information. But the the you know there are limits on that in terms of that they should keep what they're asking for, you know. The phrase used in the law is job related and not business necessity. You know, so if if it's because of some motor issue and the employee's having a motor issue and is asking for some assistive technology around their keyboard or mouse or computer, you know, the employer doesn't need a whole medical history that details their 
pass with cancer or whatever, it, you know, the medical documentation should just relate to the to the limitations and the job tasks and the accommodation that's being requested. And the other point to remember is employers really should not be asking if the impairment or if the need for accommodation is obvious. So we don't ask the person who is using a wheelchair to bring in medical documentation of their need for a ramp. And I guess the flip side of that would be too, employers shouldn't be asking questions when things are not obvious and the employee has not brought anything up. Um, you know, based on assumptions or guesses or whatever that something medical may be going on, you know, the law does prohibit employers from asking employees disability related questions. You know, they'd have to have some something tangible to to go by, you know, and if they were going to start that lot of inquiry, you know, they can't they can't just assume or, or just make a wild guess and, and start asking medical questions to employees. And sometimes people do these uh, mistakes with the best of intentions, yeah, right. wanting to build some rapport, uh, but it's an area where you do have to be careful. And on the point of assumptions, just because your great aunt or uncle had the same condition doesn't mean your employee is experiencing it in the same way. So, uh, we always have to encourage employers to kind of rein in those assumptions. And I know sometimes it's hard to think of questions on the spot, but if you do have some later, I hope you will email us at jan at askjan.org or give us a call. We'd be happy to speak to you anytime, free and confidential. Thank you, Teresa and Bill. That was a very informational presentation.